First I do as I was asked. Diavolo and Kirio Chicago's bodies were lined up on the floor of the study. We were forced to grab them and haul ass out of the house temporarily when the damn spaceship crashed. But when the ship vanished and the house rebuilt itself, we brought them back in. Police are a shit show right now. And in a case like this, you've really got to be a fucking stand master to stand the case of solving it. Said a stand belonging to one of the sturdily built Japanese twins, Nijimura Fukushima. I feel like that's a typo there. It was called NYPD Blue. Some stands had minds of their own, I was told. Not just him. Kashibi Rohan's girlfriend, Raimi, looked totally human and was giggling and whispering to in Kashibi's ear as he muttered sullenly about how unfair all this was. Was this any time to flirt? Anyway, Diavolo and Kira had had, had their throats slipped from ear to ear. Loads of blood. When they told me Tsukumajuku's throat had been slit too, I got pretty agitated, but I forced myself to concentrate. I had to look at these one at a time. Kashibi used his stand, Heaven's Door, to open the turn the two bodies into books. The sides of their faces split open, and when their skin peeled back like pages, leaving a big hole where the eye had been. But every page was filled with the word death in different languages. Apparently while people were still alive he could read all sorts of information about them. Their past, their personality, even things they themselves had failed to notice or had long since forgotten. But at the moment of their death, all of this was overwritten. I also took a look at the records made by Leona Baccio Stand Videodrome. Both Diavolo and Kira appeared in the study for an instant, let out to cry, had their throat slit and died. Kashibi had him pause video drama a moment before their deaths and turned these recordings into books, but both volumes were almost entirely blank, with only the most basic of personal information recorded within. Just their names and stands. Everything about their feelings or memories was totally gone. They knew they were about to die, and to a certain extent they would accepted it. See? Kashibi said, turning to a page that had already begun to be buried in the word death. Death begins while we're still alive. And these two were murdered, and their bodies abandoned, right where Kashibi and the police were moving in and out of here. How could that be? Were Japanese people way more self-absorbed than I'd ever imagined? I couldn't tell what passed for morality here in the future. Didn't matter. I just had to get all the facts lined up. Kashibi made it so that they were no longer books. Any images of the killer? I asked. Abachio shook his head. These are records of the victims' lives only. Were they brought here and killed at the same time, or is there a time lag between the two murders? We can't tell from the recordings, Abaccio said. All we can tell is what happened to each one individually. But we can say that the estimated time of death for both of them is 12 hours ago at 8am this morning. What happened to them? But there's no records of what they were doing before they appeared here. Yes. Which is very strange. The only way I can explain it is to say that these two men did not exist until they were killed, or that they were brought here to be killed from some day other than July 24th. You can check records from yesterday or any other day? Video drone can only check the day off, from midnight until midnight. And that only gives us one second? Or I suppose if we look at it from another angle, they could have died a second after midnight, and the estimated time of death is what's wrong. He had no answer to that. I had Abaccio replay the recordings and did my best to soak in every detail, just like Tsukumajuku used to do. If the facts were stated, they'd been dead most of the day. Comparing the 3D images video drone made with the actual bodies, and considering this house appeared with some sort of temperature control that kept it cool, even though it was summer, the condition of the bodies seemed to support that. I spent a bit of time looking from one to the other like I was trying to find the six differences, but nothing stood out. Ah, guess these goddamn gangsters ain't trying to pull one over on us with their stands, said NYPD Blue. He'd come up beside me at some point. Ah, yo, nitwit! The fuck you joining in for? Get back here! Nijimura Fukushigi yelled, but NYPD Blue was having none of it. Shut the fuck up! This is a murder investigation! No damn way I'm leaving it up to some amateur! He turned to me. Sorry, buddy. Please go on. Go on with what? I didn't have anything. But I went ahead and said, right, and turned back to the bodies. And I guess because I'd been distracted, I noticed something. Kira's face was covered in sweat, and it was dripping, dripping off his face onto his shirt. But it dried the instant it hit. This way snow vanishes as soon as it hits the ground. 
What did this mean? Sweat fell from his cheeks to his chest, but never landed. Could sweat really evaporate that quick? I started to reach out, then asked, Does touching these let us feel the bodies? Abaccio nodded. But it is a recording, so even if your hands or clothes appear to get blood on them, it's only temporary. Oh yeah? I said, and not making a big deal about it, I just reached out and touched Kira's shirt. There was no undershirt or anything between the shirt and his skin, but it was dry as a bone. As sweaty as his face was, the rest of his body should be soaked, but the shirt wasn't even damp. I wasn't up on advances in the textile industry since my day, but sweat generally took a bit of time to dry. It didn't just evaporate like it was dropped on a hot frying pan. If he'd been volcanic rock hot, I could see it, but from touching him I could tell he was a little warm, but well within the range of normal. This had to be a clue, I thought. What? There's something wrong with Kira Yoshikage's chest? Abaccio asked. He was standing next to me, watching my face intently. You found something? Don't even think about keeping it secret. Tell the truth now. I used to be a cop. I can tell if you're lying. I wasn't a good liar in the first place, but before I answered, the stand behind me said, Well there, punk. You used to be a police? Then you know the drill. Before you resort to browbeating, have a think for your damn self. And with that, NYPD Blue reached out and started pouring Kira's clothes himself. Hmm. I think you might just be on to something. <laughs> Abaccio said, and stepped up next to NYPD Blue, putting his hands on the dead man's chest. Kira was looping rapidly, letting out shout after shout as his throat split open and snapped closed again and again. I moved on to Diabolo, who was stuck in a very similar loop, and began watching him closely. Since I knew what I was looking for, I found a crick. A drop of sweat from his cheek that fell on his shoulder and was gone. Same thing. I reached out and touched the thin shirt that clung to Diabolo's body, but it was dry too. He too was sweating all over, but... Just to be sure, I peeled back his shirt and put my hand inside. Yep, Diavolo's belly was drenched, but none of it got to his shirt. How could that be? Oh, free you acting like total freaks, Mr. said, and he and Fugo cackled wildly, but I ignored it. There was something here. How could something like this happen? This wasn't some insta-drying shirt. If it was, Abaccio and NYPD Blue would have pointed it out. Precisely because this was impossible, the two of them were looking baffled and investigating further, ignoring the hecklers. So if it wasn't a fast-drying shirt, then... Fast-drying sweat? That seemed equally unlikely. No matter when I was, sweat was sweat. Physics remained physics. Drying takes time. Hmm. But to what extent did physics apply here? Look at what lay just in front of me. A tangible recording of a human's death. A humanoid superpower investigating a crime of its own free will. Everyone here was beyond my experience. They could turn books into phones, replace skulls with soap, and make six little drag queens ride bullets. The entire situation was fucked up. A town upside down in the ocean surrounded by an invisible wall. The fish swimming past us weren't gigantic. We'd been shrunk somehow. Could we judge anything based on conventional physics? We couldn't. It seemed there were still rules in effect, but physics were only relevant to a limited extent. This was the work of a stand, this sweat, this instant death, and the way he dragged them into this room and killed them, without them even trying to resist. If physics didn't apply, then perhaps things that should take time not taking time was... Wait. Time? Kira Yoshikage's stand, Killer Queen, could turn time back an hour with bites of dust. King Crimson could predict the future and erase that time. Both stand powers involve time, and both owners of these stands lay here dead together. Speaking of time, Tsukuma Duke had fallen through time from England in 1904 to Japan in 2012, and in time travelled two more times before dying. And there was one more. Mr. Kashibi, I said. The thin artist turned towards me. Didn't you say something about a clock? I did, he exclaimed, thrilled someone had actually heard him. He strolled forward. There was a clock, right here in my study, on this very desk, and it's gone missing. It was the only one I ha- way I had of telling time in this windowless room. It was hardly a valuable piece, well, gladly buy whoever took it, took it one of their own. But I'd like mine back, thank you. Well, far, Mr. said. Just buy a new one for yourself, sensei. I have affection for my own things, 
Hushibi snapped with such vigour that Mr. actually backed off. Ah, uh, no need to shout, he said. Kashibi had a knack for making everything he said sound oddly convincing. I mean, sure, I get you. I care about my stuff too, Mr. said. So give it back. I won't let anyone leave until it's returned. I thought the gangsters were keeping Kashibi here, but apparently he just turned those tables on them. I could hear people laughing quietly, impressed with his bravado, but I put my mind to thinking. A missing clock. There must be a reason for that. If Kashibi was telling the truth and it was a cheap clock, there was no benefit to stealing it. Unless whoever stole it had a reason to think having a clock here would be bad news for them. Again, time. That was the key word behind all this. The only problem was how. Time for sweat to dry. Why did it dry in an instant? Ignore physics and find the answer. Push through it. Sweat wouldn't dry instantly. It took time to dry. It only appeared to take no time. That amount of time was sped up to look like only a moment. It looked instantaneous, but it was no such thing. And by the same principle, the second it took to kill these two was not actually a second. A much longer period of time just looked like a second. Time had been sped up, and he'd hidden the clock so he wouldn't notice this had happened. That was it, I thought. I was confident I had the answer. But thought they were cl though they were clearly sped up, Neither of them were moving like they were in a movie being cranked too fast. Human bodies were never completely still, so when sped up their movements were always jerky, clearly unnatural to our eyes. But there was nothing unnatural about the way they were moving, or even the speed of the blood as it came gushing out of them. Only the sweat was strange. It formed on the cheeks slowly, like normal, then pulled and swelled and dangled and fell and dried unnaturally fast. Not just that. If this was all happening normally, I'd be able to put my hand beneath his chin and catch the drop of sweat as it fell. But the speed of their sweat was so unnatural I couldn't figure out the timing of that. What did that mean? The people were moving normally, but their sweat was sped up. The instant it left their cheeks, it fell and dried really fast. Hmm. The instant it left their cheeks. So human skin was the borderline, border surface, and the flow of time was different within and without? Was it possible for time to flow differently inside your body than outside? It must be. Otherwise, this situation was impossible. Proof lay in the stands these two had. Killer Queen could make someone explode so hard they had to relive the last hour over again, but only the person who exploded remembered what had happened, which meant time flowed differently for the bomb guy alone. Kim Crimson worked the same. Diavolo could predict the future and delete that amount of time, so if events happened in the following order, A, B, C, and he deleted B, then for everyone but Diavolo, events would flow as A, C, but for Diavolo, things would be A, his prediction of B deleting B, C, extended by the act of using his stand, but changing the flow of time for everyone else. In other words, time could flow differently inside a person and out. Most of the time, those times synced up, but if this type of stand was used, they stopped lining up. Diavolo created a smaller disconnect, but with Killer Queen, whoever he turned into a bomb could repeat that time more often the more they got scared and tried to get help. The gap between their time and real time would get bigger and bigger. And wasn't our internal sense of time always a little off? Even without the involvement of stands? I couldn't begin to believe that the time I'd spent being bullied on the Canary Islands, the time I'd spent fighting in the war, and the time I'd spent gazing at Lisa Lisa's hair streaming in the wind and gleaming in the sunlight could all have been flowing at the same speed. And the time I'd spent facing Antonio Torres inside William Cardinal in a motorised manner definitely didn't flow at the same speed as the time I'd spent deducing things next to a pair of corpses surrounded by gangsters here. When we concentrate the flow of time within us speeds up, we can think an incredible number of things in mere minutes, seconds even, so compared to the external time, the time inside us passes in a flash. Like, wait, had it really only been a minute? So right this very moment as the wheels in my head spun furiously, I was building up a gap between my internal time and the time outside of me. If time within a human being was different from time outside of us, then if you were to control one of these times, which would it be? Killer Queen turned back time inside the bomb person only, and King Crimson deleted a portion of time that only he had experienced from the timeline outside of him. And here some unknown individual stand had sped up the external time for Diavolo and Kira. This one second they spelt yelping and dying might well be only a second for them, but externally a much longer period of time was taking place, super compressed. I wasn't yet sure how long that was, but at least I'd solved the mystery of the sweat and I suppose I'd also explained how no one had witnessed their murders. Mr. Kashibi 
Is it at all possible that this room could have been left empty for, say, an hour, around eight this morning? Huh? No way, Kashibi said. That would have been the absolute busiest time. All the cops flooding in because we'd found Tsukumajuku's body. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't just their murders nobody had seen. Nobody had seen the bodies lying on the floor. So it seemed likely time had been sped up around them from midnight to the estimated time of death to the time they were found. And he, if he could inco- compress eight hours to a second to kill them, why not keep it up and do another twelve, bringing us to 8pm, the present time? If eight hours took a second, and midnight to right now was twenty hours, then that was about two and a half seconds. It wasn't out of the question for there to be two and a half seconds in which nobody was in this study. Assuming the same scale, obviously they could have sped things up even more after their deaths and made those twelve hours into one second or point one seconds, but for the moment I just needed a figure to theorise with, so let's go with two and a half seconds. They were both killed in the first second, and in the next 1.5 seconds, twelve hours worth of decomposition occurred. In only one and a half seconds? Looking at the bodies, this had clearly happened, but was there any way to be sure? Mr. Kashibi, do you happen to have a body thermometer? Kashibi grinned at me. I do. Are you planning on doing an autopsy? I was a bit taken aback, but I guess it wasn't out of character for this guy. Yeah, if you've got anything else, that would help. I do indeed. Kashibi said far too happily. I'm drawing a horror mystery manga, you see. I was curious to know just what coroners do. I've never tried them on a real dead human, but you find dead birds and cats as you wander around town, and they were most illum- illuminating. Um, uh, I wasn't the only one who'd gone quiet, but Kashibi paid no heed at all, and began expounding the details of his experiments on dead animals until his girlfriend put her hand over his mouth. Uh, mm. Oh, the body temperature, right. I'll bring the whole lot. Thanks. I turned to the duo, glaring at the mystery of the dry clothes in Videodrome's recordings. Abaccio, NYPD, I'll need your help with this. Hmm? What? Abaccio and NYPD Blue had clearly been both been so preoccupied they'd missed what we just said. We're going to perform a simple autopsy, I said. Mind taking the rectal temperature? <gasps> what? Now look here, buddy. I'm just a regular police. I ain't up for no CSI shit. They both spoke at the same time, but when I said, you can't let an amateur do it, they reluctantly agreed and took the thermometer from Kashibi. He had two. You did sterilise them, right? Abaccio said suspiciously. Kashibi was indignant. Of course I did. How rude. Who knows what awful bacteria lurk in the guts of wild birds and cats? I washed and disinfected them. Wild birds? The last time I used them was on a wild boar. It must have wandered down from the mountains, got hit by a car, but it was luckily hid in such a matter that the body was intact, and I took a photo every hour, stuck the thermometer in its rectum, and kept detailed notes on the state of the body. I, I even edited together a video. If you have 15 minutes to spare, you could see a boar be entirely consumed by maggots and reduced to nothing but bone. A Abaccio was looking a little green. Kashibi hastily wrapped things up. Uh, at any rate, those are quite clean. So Abaccio and NYPD Blue took their temperatures, and they'd both gone down between 10 and 11 degrees. Helpfully, Videodrome also allowed us to measure their initial temperature from when both were still alive. Neither Diavolo or Kira Yoshikage were at all overweight, so their temperature would drop 1 degree an hour for the first 10 hours, and then half a degree for every hour after that, so it fit my theory exactly. Next, we examined the inside of their mouths and their eyes. Their mucous membranes were partially dried. Corneal opacity was about half peak, usually reached between 24 and 48 hours after death. Then the post-mortem lividity. We lifted the bodies and checked, and the colouring was pretty much at max. This hit peak after 12 hours, so it was also consistent. The bodies were quite stiff, right at the peak of rigor mortis. Also reached 10 to 12 hours after death. Good. That's enough, I said. Both Abaccio and NYPD Blue collapsed to the floor. Figure anything out? Abaccio asked, but I ignored him. I dodged a thermometer that came flying and fought. Fought through the sound of the thermometer shattering and Kashibi's yelp of anger. Explanations should only occur after all deductions were complete. Cops are always so impatient, no matter the time or the place.
The bodies definitely had approximately 12 hours worth of decomposition. I've been proceeding with my theory unchanged while we did the autopsy, so those first eight hours must have felt like one second to Diavolo and Kira. But their corpses seem to have experienced the 12 hours since their deaths as 12 hours, not two and a half seconds. So maybe this stands time compression somehow excluded living people? No. Humans weren't the only ones who experienced the flow of time. Animals felt it too. And zombies. Okay, if this Dan could compress time while excluding those who could perceive time, then the differential between the two flows of time left the sweat hanging off their cheeks as inside as a part of their body, and the moment it disconnected from their jaws it became external and not part of their body. It looked like their clothes also counted as external, but could that be because Diavolo and Kira weren't in any condition to consider their clothes as part of their self-image? In other words, what counted as internal was based on what your mental image of yourself extended to, and everything else counted as internal and thus became affected by the other flow of time. So I thought. Next I had the killer's profile. He was a stand master of a stand that could speed up time. He killed Diavolo and Kira in that sped up time. Slit their throats. But was it really possible to cut a living person's throat this deep, this easily?